Martin uh, Cobbler. Uh, particularly, we wanted to inform the Security Council of recent developments, the fact that after a failure to have an agreement signed on the 11th of November to bring to political conclusion the Kampala process, that a lot of work had been done to encourage a process that is led by the facilitation under President Museveni of Uganda and his Minister of Defence, Minister Kionga, and we hope that tomorrow, the 12th of December in Nairobi, there will be a document co-signed by President Museveni and uh, President Joyce Banda uh, to capture the uh, uh, detailed arrangements that had already been agreed to um, in the uh, Kampala dialogue process that are still relevant, including um, the amnesty for those who have not committed crimes against humanity or other serious crimes, and a process of demobilizing M23 and having them return. And President Kabila has made it clear that he is an, a, a keen to see the return not only of those who fled to Uganda more recently from M23, but the earlier ex-combatants who fled to uh, Rwanda. Uh, we also uh, discussed the general refugee issue and the steps that were being taken, which Martin Cobbler will outline, um, to address the other um, armed uh, groups. And uh, the main message that I had conveyed on a recent regional visit um, was that we now need to go forward with a broader mediated dialogue under the peace, security, and cooperation framework, but also a peace dividend for people in the region, and I was happy to say that we have now concluded a, a women's uh, Great Lakes platform for communication and funding of women's groups that are working in the area of um, uh, the Security Council Resolution 20, 1325, um, meaning that they are also looking at the benchmarks and indicators at regional and at DRC level under the framework. Secondly, women's groups dealing with violence against women and women affected by violence, women's groups dealing with livelihoods and with access to clean energy, that they will get support um, directly from the uh, fact that they are part of a platform under the peace, security, and cooperation framework. It's time for people of the region to feel that the framework is making a difference in their lives through a peace dividend. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had the chance to brief uh, the Security Council today, in particular on the military developments in the Democrat Republic of Congo, but also on important political developments. Now, on the military side, um, as far as uh, after the uh, M23 uh, problem is militarily at least solved, MONUSCO is concentrating on the other armed groups, including, and in the first instance now, uh, on the FDLR. And uh, the operation started on the 27th of November. Uh, and yesterday and the day before yesterday, uh, important progress was made to clear areas and streets of FDLR positions. We will go, go on with this uh, fight against all our groups, including FDLR, but also the ADF more in the north. Uh, this is very important. I brought a message of hope to the Security Council. I think the situation is different now in the DRC after the end of the fight against the M23. Many areas are liberated. We create islands of stabilities in these areas, and you see it in the eyes of the population. There is still some hesitance, but there is a chance at least that this time the situation is irreversible and we are not entering in a few years from now in a new era, era of, of, of violence here. But this requires not only military action. It requires in particular civilian, determined civilian action to have the civilians catching up, getting health, getting education, getting security and stability, regulating the root causes, one of them is the conflict minerals, in an incredibly rich country, to address all these problems. Otherwise, the military success will fail, uh, and uh, we will back to square one. Military success is important, but the civilian uh, efforts to restitute state authority, to decentralize the country, to have democratization and elections, this is very important. Um, I had also the chance to brief the Security Council now on the wave of surrenders, uh, the DDR process. It's very important that now people do not see any value anymore in fighting. They want to go back to civilian life. They want to be reintegrated. I think this is a positive development, but also here it is very important.
important uh, to take the opportunity and to take this chance in order to give them a perspective in life, in particular the young population. 70% of the population of the DRC is below the age of 17. And they deserve a future in prosperity, stability and peace. And uh, I think we made in the last weeks, we made in the last months, uh, we made uh, important progress, but it is a first step. And I'm very happy that we as international envoys, in particular Mary Robinson myself, who covers the back in the regional, in, in her regional efforts, uh, because military, civilian, but the regional buy-in of a development which should aim at stability, at peace, at restitution of state authority requires uh, the cooperation of both of us and I'm, I'm quite happy we have such a good cooperation and such a good uh, understanding on the way how to proceed in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Voice of America, Margaret Bashir. Mr. Kobler, um, could you give us a few more details on the operations against the FDLR? Are you using the UAVs? Uh, what, is, what is the role of the force, uh, the intervention brigade, uh, such uh, like that? And how many FDLR do you think there still are in Eastern Congo? Well, we estimate uh, the uh, amount of SDL, FDLR combatants at around well, 1,500, 1,800, uh, but this uh, is something which is, uh, which is difficult to say. Most of them are young people. 70% are young people below the age of, um, uh, of 30. They were not involved in the 1994 genocide. So it is easier for them also to surrender to us. And we had quite a number of surrenderees. A whole platoon every month is surrendering without fighting. Uh, we started on the 27th of November in a, a city called Pinga. Um, which we liberated from several armed groups, including FDLR, but also Warlord, called uh, Cheka, Yatura, APCLS, FDLR. And this we use as a basis now for actions against other FDLR positions. Yesterday and the day before yesterday, and this is very important, the street between Pinga and another, uh, uh, another um, area uh, opening the way to Goma on the road uh, was cleared by FDLR and APCLS positions. This road was closed two years. And from yesterday on, people can bring their vegetables they, uh, to Goma market. They can visit their families outside the area after two years paralysis and being terror having been terrorized uh, by uh, armed groups in this area. I'm sure you obviously you've seen and Manusco played a role in this report about post-electoral electoral violence and, and the failure to prosecute those, those involved in it. I wanted to know what is the mission or, 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 or Ms. Robinson, what's going to be done to have the government actually bring the, the, the named perpetrators to account and also on the Manova rapes. I know that the trial began. Some say that the, you know commanders weren't, weren't named or that it's going. What's your sense of it and what deadline has the UN set to actually either implement the human rights due diligence policy or not? based on the outcome of the trial? Well, the human rights due diligence policy is an ongoing process. We only work together with FARD units, FARDC units, uh, which are vetted and which correspond to our human rights due diligence policy. Um, and you did not hear of major human rights violations in Eastern Congo now since August or September. We observe this very intensely. Um, this is totally different like a, like a year ago, but it cannot be excluded. And we have now reports of, of increasing uh, human rights violations also of the FRDC, also of uh, vetted units. And we check with the units we are cooperating with uh, every single detail. On MONUVA, the um, legal proceedings are going on. Um, this is very important that there is accountability and uh, the fight against impunity. Um, the uh, military court uh, is, uh, is doing this in, the, um, in, in, in Goma. Uh, the, at this stage, um, the 41 people are indicted. So far, it opened end of, um, uh, end of November. Only the 40 were, were interrogated, were, uh, were questions, but no victims yet.
Oh, uh, Andre Villas from Agence France Presse. Can you be more specific on the role and uh, performances of the drones in this operation? And how long do you see the operation developing? Well, first of all, let me say we are quite happy to have now the, uh, the unarmed drones. I do not even try with the press now, I mean, to say unmanned uh, something vehicles, UAVs. These are unarmed drones who, um, whom we uh, use now. They were launched a, uh, a week ago with a visit of uh, USG uh, Latsus in Goma. I think it's very important. First of all, the deterrent effect of the drones. If you see the imagery where you can see from 2,000 meters, um, uh, you see students, uh, children playing football in a, in a, in a backyard. Uh, and you can identify the faces, and uh, we spread these images. This is a deterrent, I think, to all armed groups to better surrender and to better disarm without fighting. These drones are, however, unarmed, and I must say they are a mission asset. They are not exclusively for military purpose. They are useful for IDPs, for displaced persons, for refugee streams, for disaster relief, uh, and we also will use them for the civilian purpose. That's important to know, but at the beginning now, in the trial phase, in the test phase, we will use them for, um, for military purpose, to identify targets, uh, to have reconnaissance, to improve our information of our intelligence. It's an invaluable instrument. Thank you very much. And would you say that the amount of military success you've seen so far is due to the amount of information provided by these Last UAVs? Last question I didn't get. Do you plan to increase the number of, what, how soon do you plan to increase the number of UAVs currently in operation? And uh, the military success is possible because of the information gathered by these UAVs? Well, military success is possible in particular by the soldiers we have on the ground. Uh, and uh, the, human, uh, the human element of military operations, this is the most important thing. But let me say again that primarily we do not want to fight. Yes, we have the intervention brigade, but also, yes, we want people to disarm voluntarily without a single uh, 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 shot fired. Now, the UAVs, we have two on the ground now. We have uh, three more coming until uh, beginning of next year, and this will improve our intelligence capacity to, uh, to have should fighting, uh, should we enter into fights with uh, now during the current fighting with armed groups to improve our capability uh, to have information, not to expose our people um, to, uh, to risks. One, one important topic, I gave clear guidance to use also the UAVs uh, to avoid civilian casualties during the fighting. This is very important for um, a intervention brigade of the United Nations to say, yes, we fulfill the mandate, yes, we target and neutralize offensively armed groups, but not with the risk of having civilian casualties. And the FDLR, for example, they have their families living with them. We will not engage in fighting overly endangering civilian casualties, and the UAVs are, have an invaluable, are, are invaluable in this respect. Thank you very much.